Excellent. Thank you for uh, showing up here in the afternoon, which basically means I'm <coughs> more or less between you and a cold beer, uh, and then you taking the effort to come here and listening and talking to me, uh, or me talking about exciting things like eyes on rooms. It's, uh, it's heartwarming. So, first of all, I really would like to uh, have a, a big thank you for the people uh, who organize Open City Conference and this awesome event every year. I'm just really happy to be um, uh, part of the program. Many of you may have seen me before. I'm part of the furniture in some ways. Uh, actually, Swebber and I have also been, uh, in prior years, organizers for Open Studio Conference. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, Doug and video team and everybody involved. So very shortly um, about me and why I am interested in this topic. So I am owner of a company called Open Ovations. And Open Ovations specializes uh, in data management, data analysis, data processing, basically anything data in the medical and pharma uh, domain. Um, and in fact, some other very highly regulated domains like FinTech uh, and government. Now, when you perform any kind of data uh, analysis or processing in such domains, it means that you have a very high level of rules and regulations and requirements that you have to take into account for cybersecurity, uh, data integrity, confidentiality, etc. And the, the most well-known norms in that domain are the ISO 27001 and its uh, sister norm, uh, the 27002. So the 27001 is all about how to set up a risk-based information security management system within your organization. It doesn't really tell you how to protect your information. It tells you how to set up the management system to protect the information. <coughs> and then the 27002 is the accompanying norm, which gives a lot of measures, uh, examples for measures and security controls uh, that you can implement. There are also quite a number of uh, national and more branch-specific variations uh, of these norms in the Netherlands. Of course, we as Dutch feel that we should do everything on our own and double. Um, we have a specific NEN uh, 7510 norm, which is essentially um, a combination of the 27001 and two, uh, but then strictly focusing on the medical and healthcare domain. Um, but also on information exchange in the medical and healthcare domain. So uh, cryptography of data in trans transit, uh, data at rest, all kinds of security controls. Now, a question could be, what does this actually matter for open source? Because, you know, I'm an open source contributor. I just publish my package. <coughs> and it's up to somebody else to decide if he or she wants to use this package and then figure out if it's actually fit for purpose uh, in the domain in which I want to use uh, the package. And of course, there's a big domain uh, discussion going on at the moment also about uh, how much involvement there is or should be uh, from open source communities in uh, law and regulation uh, processes about uh, cybersecurity uh, mandates for uh, governmental institutions using uh, open source and open standards. So I hope to address these uh, in the next um, couple of minutes. I have about 25. And I really would like you uh, to ask me questions. If there's anything uh, unclear, please open up. <coughs> so there are uh, several ISO norms at the moment involved in cybersecurity uh, and open source, and none of them uh, was really targeting open source from the beginning. There were all more or less industry norms uh, who came into being much before uh, actually organizations started figuring out what the source of their uh, software was, what the source of their uh, components was. And open source, of course, being uh, a public repository of available uh, packages that you can use was on its own never necessarily meant 
uh, to be used in a very specific context. It was just published and it was made available uh, and people and other organizations could uh, try and figure out how they wanted to use it. But uh, in recent updates uh, of the norms, um, actually these normal committees have been trying to involve uh, subject matter experts from the open source community to actually provide input um, on how to kind of encapsulate open source, uh, the phenomena of open source, into uh, their specific domain um, uh, requirements. And when I say that, I mean, how do I deal with components that are just basically being published out there and being not necessarily in any way um, published specifically for the domain that I'm using it in. So how can I be sure that this component does what it's supposed to do? Uh, how can I be sure that the supply chain underneath uh, the product is secure? Who, who is actually accountable for that if I have a community of people uh, putting stuff in the world but actually not being a supplier? So the idea uh, that is now materializing is through public consultations and um, ISO is one example of an organization, uh, but also the European Commission does this. They ask for input. They have websites in which they publish lists uh, of all the laws and regulations that they're working on uh, and that they're publishing <coughs> and that they want to have input on. But it's our responsibility as the open source community, and maybe not even us as individuals, but more like the, the bigger open source conservatories, uh, like the Eclipse Foundation and our Linux Foundation, to actually provide input on those consultations. Um, uh, there recently was this statement by, I think, about 15 uh, big open source conservatories uh, giving criticism on the process uh, around the Cyber Resilience Act that is being created in Europe. And their criticism was like, why were we not invited? But that's really the other way around. It, it, you know, you, you didn't actually put yourself at the table, and when you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So, <coughs> uh, dear open source conservatories, please pay attention, because there are, especially within the EU, it's a very open and transparent process. Um, all consultations are always published. All input is also usually uh, published. The decision-making process is actually open and transparent, but if you just don't pay attention and then start raising a lot of noise after an initial draft has been uh, published, yeah, you, you really are too late. So I, I really hope, <coughs> and that's one of the reasons why I'm giving this talk, is also uh, if you have any interaction with these uh, conservatories and uh, I also have that in person. Please also stimulate them to be involved in these uh, normative processes and this uh, legislation process. So, because there is really evolution happening. If you look at the new um, uh, 2751 and 2 norms, there is much more attention for cloud, uh, for supply chain, uh, but also for interaction with your supplier. <coughs> the, the norms used to be mostly um, inward focus. Like, if you implement this within your organization, then you're doing well. But the new norms are much more about, all right, you have your own organization, but you also have suppliers. How do they relate to your security? Does your uh, supplier uh, provide you with a system that is of a certain criticality level for your uh, primary process? If so, then you may actually want to engage with that supplier to align uh, their change management process <coughs> and make sure that you know what your supplier does in terms of uh, information security measures. And the 27002, as I mentioned before, this is the norm that has most of the security controls and examples in it, has been really extended with a lot of, uh, yeah, let's say, reasonable expectations and reasonable measures from uh, the, the work domain since 2013 and between now, we really had a lot of evolution uh, in terms of maturity and professionalism, uh, mainly also in multi-stakeholder uh, information security process uh, challenges. <coughs> so the risk controls that have now been introduced are much more about a risk-based approach than they are about like checklist management. So the difference between those two is before they were very prescriptive in terms of 
You should follow this, and then you're probably secure. The norms now follow a risk-based approach, which is about, all right, what information and data am I actually managing? How is this exposed to which risk, and how does that risk translate from a risk on the information integrity or availability or confidentiality into my primary business uh, domain? If this bit of information is not available or compromised or uh, leaks outside, how does this impact my, my primary business uh, into actually being able to perform a business or, um, or services? And it's also much about continuous improvement. Uh, the 2013 version was much more about you should create your information security management system roughly according to this, and then you have it, and yeah, sure, you should update it, but figure that out on your own. You should do a yearly update. <coughs> and the new norm uh, gives much more guidance into how that update process actually can work and how to embed it uh, in your organization. In example, how to deal with incident management, how to deal with trend management uh, on incidents, how to do root cause analysis uh, of incidents or calamities, and how to also align uh, your incident uh, and change procedures with your suppliers, because an incident can also be your supplier doing an update where, which makes a certain function unavailable because just dropped off their roadmap, <coughs> which isn't necessarily a security problem per se, but it's a problem for your organization because all of a sudden you're not able to do what you were able to do. So, and there's also a very specific control, uh, A945, which is about provenance, which is about supply chain uh, quality vetting and quality control. More on that later. So, of course, a lot of the stuff that is referenced here for especially open source is kind of already common uh, procedure. I mean, we've been using uh, version code uh, repositories since forever. <coughs> we all do code signing, yes. And um, we, we're, we're pretty much aware of what it is we include in our software because we have these nice package.json files that tells us everything that's in there, right? All right, maybe there's more, but we have actually a pretty good baseline. Um, and especially when it comes to modern open source stacks versus uh, monolithic proprietary software that has been bubbling around for years and years and years, especially in the medical and pharma domain where we work, we have suppliers that literally are still using Borlam Delphi in versions that should be punishable by law um, for laboratory information management systems, in example. <coughs> but the thing is, they work. And in a laboratory, what they usually then do is they just uh, compartmentalize the network, m make sure that the lab network is not connected to the internet, and then nothing can go wrong. Right. So the new norms are m much more about also how to deal with such events. Also, actually giving examples and guidance, and there are some laws that also do the same, about if you are running legacy software systems, start planning your exit. Because the problem, and this is another thing that may be very obvious, but just to realize, <coughs> the life cycle of a computerized system and the life cycle of the value of the actual data that's being kept in the computerized system are two completely different things. Um, in pharma, we have to keep records of uh, clinical trial data uh, available for until 25 years after uh, a certain medicine has been active in the market, which basically means in IT terms, forever. <coughs> so it's very naive to have uh, an approach that actually ties both the information as well as the software together because it comes. You, you will have to migrate your software. You will have to move data out of its original context into either an archiving system or in uh, an, an open source data management system that coincidentally we managed to provide, but that's just a detail. Um, but then again, when we have conversations with laboratories and clinics about leveraging open source in that context, there's still a lot of predispositions and prejudice going on. It's, there, there, is a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of news, of course, about OpenSSL uh, being maintained by two and a half person, uh, Look4j, etc., etc. So it, it, believe it or not, but we still have a pretty bad rep 
uh, in a lot of enterprise environments. Which it's, it's neither fair nor it's unfair. It's just you need to consider how many millions of open source packages are available. And then, yeah, sure, you will always find one that's, um, that's leak, that has a problem. <coughs> but in a more procedural aspect, uh, stuff that we can actually prevent ourselves much better is license incompatibilities. Um, I, I dare say that there are nowadays very few actually large-scale enterprise-level open source products that do not have a certain license incompatibility anywhere in their stack, because it's just almost impossible. We, we as a community, <coughs> need to start looking more into governance on that level, because from an organization point of view, that is as much of an information security risk as having the software not being supported anymore, because the risk now could be that whenever the maintainer of this one package that has this one incompatible license finally wakes up and start making noise, that is disruptive for them. Something for us. <coughs> a lot, another um, bit of prejudice is that there is a lack of contract-based support uh, for open source. And when, when I say that, they usually mean I want to have a one-stop shop for everything open source, because I consider open source to be this slight homogeneous uh, ecosystem instead of, let's say, a million different uh, developers, which really isn't a problem. The, the, the support is there. Uh, it's just not easy to find always. It really would help, in example, if uh, open source uh, projects would, by default, on their websites, on their GitHub readme's, provide a list of companies that actually supports it so that companies that want to use it <coughs> have less problem finding it. Um, but also there have been a number of things not in our favor. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, the Faker JS or Color JS um, problem that we had a couple of years ago. But this was a developer who for some reason got pissed off by something uh, and he decided to deliberately uh, poison his uh, libraries and then causing problems for tens of thousands other uh, software packages depending on it. And the same was uh, for this other developer who didn't like GitHub to uh, make him do multi-factor authentication and then just pulled his project and resubmitted it so that he didn't have to do multi-factor authentication. I'm sorry, but seriously? <laughs> so what should we actually do as uh, maintainers of libraries or any uh, open source reselling company conduct regular security assessments on anything you do, which includes, am I really using all these tens of thousands of dependencies, or can I maybe just drop um, half of them? Because anything that is dead code that you don't use is an attack factor. Make sure, and nowadays with software build-up material tools, that becomes much easier. Make sure that we actually are um, compliant with the reasonable open source licenses, and I will probably be chastised for saying that, but uh, let's say anything RSI uh, compliant. Also, make sure that you test for compatibility issues when you do uh, integrations, and that means continuous testing. <coughs> and us using open source and putting open source at customers also means that customers themselves can decide to start using certain components of our stack in a different way that we originally imagined. So that can also mean that when we replace a certain library with a certain other uh, library and for us everything works, whereas our customer actually is relying on this one bit of functionality that we didn't think of, for them, it may break. So include your customer-specific uh, elements in uh, testing. And make, just make sure that you actually have uh, an incident response process in place and also verify uh, that it works. I mean, there's nothing more shit than having a security vulnerability and somebody actually helpfully reporting it, and that email then being flat as spam, and then you end up on slash lot because you didn't fix it, whereas you had been notified. So just make sure that your processes are in place. But nowadays there's also help, uh, and quite a lot of it. <coughs> and actually by the big tech as well. Uh, Red Hat is investing a lot at the moment in supply chain security, uh, quality control. Google is doing that. Uh, of course, there are other commercial parties that do that, like JFrog. <coughs> and the, um, this, this is not 
coincidental. I mean, this is uh, literally because there are now our laws, either in effect or in the making, that make companies do that. Because it is very simple. Um, if there is no governmental law making sure that a company needs to oblige to it, companies will usually not do it. So now we have uh, Google, Embedded, and Microsoft, and a lot of others actively scanning open source uh, packages, communicating with maintainers, uh, and helping fix bugs. Yay. I hope that the next step is that these companies will actually start paying the developers a fair amount of money for the awesome work that they do, because to me that's another security risk that you have a million, uh, millions of people doing basically voluntary work that benefits uh, billion dollar enterprises, so we should target that next, but that's another topic. <coughs> but the whole point is that we are finally looking not just at what we put in the market, but also what is the stuff that we put in the market consisting of? And how can we improve the security of those uh, components? And this also goes when you do provide certain services to uh, clients, it may ensure that you align with them uh, in your change management process. Make sure that you, they know your roadmap. Make, you make sure that you know the roadmap of the components that you work with, that you are aware of what's coming, <coughs> and that you can do an impact assessment uh, of whatever change is actually in the works. And again, maybe not even by yourself, but maybe by the symphony framework or Django, uh, because they may also change their uh, behavior. And also make sure that your client really understands uh, the change of the impact, because as I mentioned, clients may actually do stuff on their own with the open source stuff that we provide them. So make sure that there's a, a, a deep understanding of what it is they use, how they use it, and what are they depending on. Now, there has been a lot of noise on the uh, securing open source uh, software act <coughs> and the EU Cyber Resilience Act, and it mainly boils, usually boils down to who can be held accountable for something that has been made by a volunteer and put online just for reasons of a volunteer wanting to be nice and sharing something. So that's a very noble principle, but if you are a governmental organization managing private, private uh, data, uh, financial data and all that, <coughs> you better be sure that whatever it is you use is fit for that purpose. So the new laws are not just kind of targeting making an open source developer is life miserable. It's really not about that. It's about we have very high value information. We do not want that information to be uh, compromised, disrupted, or whatever. <coughs> How can we build up layers of trust and layers of measures to do that? And as usual with laws, um, if you let a lawmaker on his own come up with an idea that you don't help out trying to form this idea with, then the idea that they will come up with is usually pretty good, but not necessarily in any way relevant for the domain that it's trying to solve. So be involved. Um, in the US, federal agencies now have to establish an open source software security program. Uh, they have to identify and make an inventory um, of the open source software that they use, where they use it, how they use it, uh, make sure that they have a process in place of identifying vulnerabilities. Uh, in the Netherlands, we actually work with the Ministry of Health uh, for delivering some security monitoring uh, infrastructure for their uh, COVID data exchange infrastructure. <coughs> and one component that we're involved with is an open source uh, vulnerability assessment tool that continuously scans everything in the whole environment, uh, keeps track of anything, any version of any bit of software that's there. So when Log4j uh, happened, uh, some years ago, we were able to upgrade uh, roughly a thousand machines in a matter of hours because we knew exactly where it was. Make sure that you know where stuff is that you use. And then there are also uh, several initiatives from the open source domain themselves into either informal or self-certification or certain benchmarks. Of course, there's OWASP, but you have the open chain. Uh, pro the project, you have the core infrastructure initiative, open source security foundation. <laughs> and they all boil down to um, bundling and sharing knowledge and competence about how to build layers of trust into security. Because security itself is a, is a meaningless con uh, concept. It's like cyber. Who tells me what cyber is? I mean, Doctor Who? I don't know. It boils down to do you know 
the information that you're dealing with, who uses it, in which process does it, do they use it, how critical is that information for that process, <coughs> and what happens if that information, for whatever reason, is not available at that point in time for that process, and how can we work around it. So now we have uh, a couple of initiatives that you can probably just look up on your own because I have only four minutes left. Um, but uh, these are actually very young initiatives. They're both, uh, in this case, in, uh, from Google, uh, their involvement. Uh, one is about harvesting metadata um, on installed software packages in a whole environment and creating a graph from all the packages and the versions and the dependencies and all that. Essentially, more or less the same tool that we built in the Ministry of Health that allowed us to identify where we were using Block4j uh, and just being able to immediately replace that. And then we have Salsa, and that is a framework for maturity levels on how to deal uh, with your knowledge and understanding of your own stack, and how certain you are that when you implement certain changes in your stack based on security incidents or whatever, uh, that there are no unintended side effects. Um, look into them, they really are um, noteworthy. And if you run a business that does anything with open source software, and sitting here, chances are pretty high of that. <coughs> you will be um, required to do that by law, either already in the US or um, uh, in the EU very soon. But it's not about being required by law. It's actually just a very good idea to know what you're running and where you're running it. Oop, that was too fast. So um, yeah, Salsa is the framework. And the whole aim is that by adding the supplier layer of um, being aware of what runs where, what it does, how it impacts what, makes the overall ecosystem more resilient. Because we as suppliers, by knowing what runs where and what it's used for, are able to communicate that back to the open source uh, developer. And then the developer may or may not decide to actually improve his security or let us help him or her improve their security. So two things uh, that I just want to point out. Who is already using Trivi? You should. Awesome. Winner. Um, who is using SonarCube? You should. <coughs> Trivi is a, <coughs> a security vulnerability scanning tool for containers or file systems. Uh, it basically runs through an entire installation and tells you what's broken or vulnerable. And SonarCube is something that uh, analyzes your code complexity, uh, site redundancy, um, code smell, uh, and whatnot. And you definitely want to have that in your code base, especially as it matures over time. We actually use it also for our dependencies. We scan our dependencies with SonarCube because it tells us what has changed in those dependencies and it gives us more insight. Uh, on how to deal with those changes. And I have one minute left for questions, and these are my contact details. <coughs> if you want to know anything more, as I mentioned, Open Ovations is specialized in data management and processing, but we also do regulatory compliance consultancy in a very practical and pragmatic manner. So we won't bore you to death with just the rules. We'll help you out to implement them. Um, but do you have any questions in 30 seconds? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, ISO standards, and maybe this one not as much, but sometimes they had the um, they were rumored to be not as practical as creating a management system that's not then effective. Um, you spoke about updates. Uh, what is your opinion about the practicality and actual impact to security uh, with these updates? Enormously improved. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the 2022 versions of the norms <coughs> are much more... Um, this, uh, they are more guidance than they are prescriptive. Uh, and I think before they were more prescriptive of checklists, what should you do, and now they give more context on why you should do it and in which environment you should do it. Does that answer your question? No, thank you. Next. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, so you mentioned, for example, SonarCube. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who distribute uh, downstream software where they perhaps found something in Sonia Cube where you can find a popular open source software. Many potential flaws, which are not real flaws, but code smells, 
and Sonar Cube, and, and you go to, to your upstream and say, this is bad because Sonic Cube yeah. says Boo. this. Boo. Yeah. Exactly. So <coughs> do you have experience with that? Because I don't think this is a constructive approach. Well, it, it really depends. I mean, if you're a supplier that immediately believes everything your automatic code tool says, then you're in trouble. So you should definitely do uh, an assessment on if it's worth the effort for the maintainer and supplier to look into something. And if it's really not broken, then it may just be preference. And so, yeah, um, I, I mean, in the Netherlands, we're famous for our concept name bordering, which means we discuss every topic to death. <coughs> but that means we also come up usually with a sensible compromise. But I think that what I'm trying to say here especially is when you're a supplier and you run Sonic Cube on your dependencies, as we do, <coughs> we're very hesitant in pushing back anything um, to the original developer if it's not really an obvious problem. An obvious problem, I mean either impacting data integrity uh, or processes and whatnot. That's it. Okay, thanks. And you can visit me uh, anytime. I'm here all week. <laughs>